Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. Let's welcome our next guest to the show. And uh, delighted we are that uh, he's agreed to come on. Um, how do you quantify him? Well, he's uh, a politician, a broadcaster, an activist. Mentioned earlier on uh, his campaigning against the poll tax many years ago. And maybe he wouldn't mind me calling him an agitator. That's no bad thing. Uh, he's a former member of the Scottish Parliament. A uh, member of the Scottish Parliament, that's right. And um, I, I, I said it earlier, and I mean it. I admire him for standing up to the criminal poll tax. He went to prison for that. People should never forget that. We're going to chat... Uh, today about the the future of Scottish independence, uh, the European Union. We'll talk about freedom of the press as well, and a little bit about Rupert Murdoch. Why not? Because that's topical today. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter, and do follow him on Twitter. It's at Citizen Tommy. Let's welcome to the programme for the first time, Tommy Sheridan. Tommy, welcome to the show. Hi. How are you? How's it going, Richie? Can you hear me okay, mate? I can hear you loud and clear. I hope you're getting us strong as well, son. I'm, get, I'm getting you guys loud and clear, and um, that was a, a very kind uh, intro that you gave me. You reminded me of the poll tax days when I had a full set of hair. That was a, <laughs> a long time ago, unfortunately, Richie. My, uh, my 11-year-old daughter doesn't believe that I once had the uh, long, flowing locks of hair, but I, I drag out all the poll tax photos to show her and... Uh, she says it's not me, you know, but there you go. But it is you. You know what's remarkable? About the time that you were going to prison for standing up to the tyrannical poll tax, in my city of Waterford in the southeast of Ireland, there was a serious struggle going on over water rates at the yep. time. And there was, a, there was an incident in my town that got international attention. And I was thinking of you today when I was thinking about it. Men were coming into communities that were hard up and they were turning off people's water Water. Supplies, right? And you remember this. And oh, I remember it. You remember, remember it. And, yeah. There was a fantastic campaign against it. I mean, and, and the communities um, that were affected, uh, uh, if I can recall, got very much involved. And there was a, there was a guy called Joe Higgins who was very much involved as well. And he, I, f- I think he went on to be elected to the the parliament on, on the back of his, his anti-water charge campaign. And, That's right. That's right. And I remember in Waterford, the community came together and it it made international news. They surrounded a van where there was men in the van and they were turning off water and they were being rude to people and they were laughing at people. And they surrounded the van and kept these guys in the van for nearly two days. And it nearly turned very ugly and it was bad. But in the end, the men were unharmed. But I often think about this was pre-social media, pre-mobile phones, pre the distractions, a time when people would come together and stick up for one another. And I'm going to put this to you straight away before we talk European Union. And I'm not, going to, I'm not trying to depress you, Tommy. Are the days when working men and women will come together to do stuff together by force of numbers, are we seeing the end of those days? Rich, I don't think so. I, I don't uh, believe that to be the case. I, I, I do believe um, it can be difficult for men and women who are up to their necks in all sorts of debts, whether it be housing debts or whether it be holiday debts or whether it be car debts, and they're very very worried about taking industrial action in case they lose their jobs. Um, You've got an economy which is run on credit. I mean, if if you looked at the the, the levels of credit just now, it is absolutely remarkable, and really it's a bubble that's going to burst again. We're almost back to pre-2008 situation um, and I think there's another economic crash on the horizon. We've had the longest period, Richie, of sustained cuts in real wages since um, the 20th century and, uh, you know, that's biting into people's living standards but people are worried about taking action in case they lose what they've got and, you know, fear can be a a, a great incapacitator, you know, it, it it can cause people not to do things that they think's right because they're frightened of the consequences. And sometimes, Richie, I mean, poll tax is an example way back in the late 80s, early 90s. I've got to say loud and clear here, it wasn't Tommy Sheridan or anybody else that was the biggest recruiting sergeant for the anti-poll tax campaign. It was poverty that was the biggest recruiting sergeant for the anti-poll tax campaign. People could not afford to pay the extra charge, and they were looking for a way out. They were looking for a battle 
all people that me did was provide a focal point, provide someone at the microphone instead of there being an, an empty microphone. We went up to the microphone and we said, hey, let's stick together. Let's have mass non-payment. Let's stop the sheriff officers and don't be terrorized any longer. I don't think that the days of that are gone forever. I do think there are wonderful examples. Um, I, I know you've got the, the Jobstown campaign in, uh, in, in Ireland just now, which is, is, you know, the Jobstown Not Guilty campaign yeah, yeah. Is, is a big, big campaign. And I think a lot of people are involved with that as well. But all over the planet, Richie, that there are people standing up all the time and they don't always get the publicity they deserve. And let's face it, the, the, the mass media, the mainstream media, they do their job to make sure that we only get to see what they want us to see. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Tommy Sheridan is on the line quarter past the hour uh, this uh, Thursday. Thrilled that he's on. Tommy, we, but the nature of this programme, you know who we are, and it's a credit that you'll come on and talk to us. Not every politician will. A lot of politicians do, but a lot don't. They say, oh, you're crazy conspiracy theorists. They won't talk to us. So it's, it's to your credit that you'll come on and have a chat with us. I campaigned against... The, uh, campaigned. I said I would never vote for the UK to stay in the European Union because I believe centralisation of power is terrible um, and so many other things that I'm not going to get into here. Now, you um, said many times that it, the European Union was anti uh, the working man, the working woman, and you understood um, and said why it might be best it might be best for us not to be in it. But you also, uh, of course, uh, campaigned for Scottish independence, and I wholeheartedly support that. Why wouldn't um, Scottish men and women want to be independent of the crown? But what Nicola Sturgeon is saying um, is. It can't be described as anything other than silly and bizarre and nonsensical. To want to gain independence from London, but then to hand it over to the bureaucrats of the European Union and put Scotland in the, the firing line where, where what happened to Greece, Spain, Italy, Ireland would undoubtedly happen to Scotland. Um, she's mad. Now tell me this, you're in Scotland, right? Is the support for the European Union as far as you understand it in Scotland, is it as great as we are being led to believe by the BBC and by Sky News? Richard, that's a, it's an interesting question, mate, and obviously I was uh, among those who campaigned um, for leaving the European Union, as, as you've said. I, I've got a state categorically I was very much involved with the trade unionists against the European Union campaign and not the knuckle-dragging, um, immigrant-hating, yeah. um, Farage-like characters who want to blame somebody else uh, or for, all, for all of the world's problems instead of blaming big business and the rich for the problems. I mean, I've got to laugh, you know, for the people like Farage come across as anti-establishment. The guy is the establishment. You know, this is a public schoolboy, educated, millionaire stockbroker who then wants to stand up for the working class. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you couldn't make it up. If, if you saw it in a film, you'd say, oh, that script's far too mad. You, you, you couldn't follow it. So from my point of view, the European Union as an institution is fundamentally anti-socialist, anti-democratic, overly bureaucratic. I, I want an independent Scotland, Richie. Completely independent. And that means independent of the UK, independent of any organisation like the EU. I hope we've not lost Tommy, have we? Are you there, Tommy? Ah, we might have lost him momentarily. Tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll reconnect with him. And um, I'll do that now. I won't um, take any music because I don't want to uh, waste any more time than I have to. Let's see, can we get him, let, let's see, can we get him back on now? We... We lost you momentarily, Tommy. Oh, Sorry about that. I don't know that. what happened. But it's, it's a landline as well, so it should be okay, but there you go. Yeah, you just it's dropped prob out. Probably MI5, mate. It could be MI5, you never know. Listen, you were right in the middle of, um, it was brilliant, you said the you don't want Scotland to be part of a European Union which is fundamentally undemocratic, and then you got cut off in your prime, so carry well, on. What, what, what I would advise, any, anyone with a, a semblance of interest in this question should go and look at the Copenhagen Treaty. And the Copenhagen Treaty sets out the rules of engagement and membership of the European Union. And one of the fundamental rules is that not only do you have a free market economy, but that you promote a free market economy. In other words, the European Union over this last two decades has been the major driver of privatisation of public services 
all across Europe. They have dripped dry all of our public services, from railways to postal services. I don't want to be a member of that particular union. I want to be an independent country that decides, for instance, in relation to wind, wave, and solar power, that we want it to be publicly owned and controlled so that we can properly invest in it and develop it, and we can have an alternative to fossil fuel, and we can actually gain money for society rather than for private uh, shareholders. Um, and from my point of view, the Brussels bureaucracy would turn around to a question like that and say, oh, no, I'm sorry, you can't publicly own that. That would be anti-competitive. That's well, right. I'm sorry, mate. Once you've elected your government to do certain things, they should be allowed to get on with it. Tommy, nobody could argue with that. That's absolutely spot on. You know, the economist Steve Keen was on the programme last night, and Steve acknowledged that what, what has happened to the European countries, particularly the southern European countries, and then, of course, the Republic of Ireland, is that he acknowledged that it was, it, it was modus operandi for the central banks to get these countries up to their necks in debt to then take the real wealth. Now, we get called conspiracy theorists here. I said privately to Steve, you know, before we spoke yesterday, I said, there was a time when you would have been called a conspiracy theorist for saying that. And he said, well, whether I would or not, that's the way it's been. That's what's happened to these countries. I mean, there isn't anything left in Ireland. Every state asset is gone. It's the same in Greece. And if Scotland were to, um, to join the European Union, um, there would be, in my opinion, now, and, and feel free to shoot me down if I'm wrong, but in my opinion, there would be a brief period of apparent prosperity. Loads of money for everybody. And then that boom followed I'm by a massive even, do bust, you know, I'm right? not even sure we would get, we would get that wee uh, no. wind that, that you guys got for a wee while because things um, across the European Union uh, are so brutal now and so centralised in favour of, of, of the big markets. There's one example, and may, this may not mean a lot to, to all of your listeners, Richie, but it, for anyone in Scotland, this will mean a lot. There's one example of what the European Union means. We, 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 we have got a ferry company called Caledonian McBrain. And this ferry company services all of the islands of Scotland. We're, we're, we're an island country. We're a country that's made up of several islands. And it's a publicly owned company. And in order for us to meet European rules, seven years ago, we were forced as a country to put those services out to tender in order to allow the free market an opportunity. Now, it cost over a million pounds, and Caledonia McBrain won the tender anyway, but the point is, that's a lifeline service, and the European Union dictated, no, no, it'd be anti-competitive, you have to put it out to tender. That is just nonsense, Richie. And see, when it comes to things like gas, electricity, water, for God's sake, who on earth thinks those should belong to private shareholders instead of belonging to the people? Those services should belong to the people, and anything made from the jet that those services should be put into schools and hospitals and roads and social services, not into the pockets of the fat cats. You know, yesterday afternoon, I um, we our studio is actually um, it's built in 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 a house in South Manchester. And um, it's 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 a recent uh, development. It's a wonderful thing, and we we live right next door to it. And we got a letter in the post the other day: fifteen percent increase on your gas and electricity, right across the board. It doesn't matter who your provider is. Now, my um, fiance Tommy, she's got a, a decent job. We do okay here at the radio show. People think we do better than we do because we have an enormous audience. We don't brag. People think oh, we're rolling in it. We're not. We're not. It's an independent radio show. We don't have the sorts of sponsorship that people think, you know, that we might have. We don't have it. But but we're, we're okay, my future um, missus and I. We're just about okay. But I met a guy the other morning and, uh, and he was white in the face. And you talked at the very beginning of this about people being on the margins. And I said, I must up with you. And he got the same letter. And he said, Richie, I'm not making it up. That's going to crucify us, that. Our electricity bill's going up by 15%. We can barely make it as it is. And this particular friend um, is looking after a senior relative. I mean, Tommy, and, and, and there's nobody going to argue with that. There's nothing you can do about that. Either you pay or you don't pay. And if you don't pay, you have no heat, you have no light. 15%, just like that. But Richie, the, the thing that really upsets me, brother, is... 
we have a political landscape. You, you've got programmes like Question Time that will be on the BBC later tonight. And you've got a political landscape that is the equivalent of four baldy men fighting over a brush. Because the truth is, they're all telling you the same thing. Not, not, not one of them is saying, by the way, it's wrong that electricity is privately owned. It's wrong that gas is privately owned. It's wrong that our water is privately owned. When are we going to get real alternatives? For God's sake, we used to own these things. They used to be part of our national wealth, our national treasure. Thatcher stole them from us. And as far as I'm concerned, it's way beyond the time that we take these things back, along with telecommunications, along with transport, and we run them for the good of the people, not for the enrichment of the few. That's, what, that's a perspective that isn't getting put on the political landscape, unfortunately. What about Jeremy Corbyn? Because Corbyn ran on this basic platform and he got this massive mandate down here and had people weighed in behind him. And programmes like ours were heavily criticised for not endorsing him or supporting him. And I said at the time, look, because I'm a very easygoing guy, Tommy, I'm not the most domineering guy in the world. You know, I have a platform and I express my opinion sometimes, but I'm not domineering about it. But at the time I said, look, I don't believe that Corbyn is going to be able to achieve the things that he's saying he wants to achieve because I, I'm not convinced of his his commitment to it. You know, it's an easy thing to say when you're on the back benches. You know, we should own the telecommunications companies. Richie, we should own this. I tell you, I tell What's you happened what I to him, Jeremy? Tommy? I, I met Jeremy. I, I met Jeremy way back in 1989 when I, when I was a young whippersnapper down in Parliament trying to get the campaign group of MPs to back the mass non-payment campaign. I had the pleasure to meet with Tony Benn, with, with, with Jeremy Corbyn, Dennis Skinner, um, with, with Terry Fields, with, with Dave Nellis. We're trying to get these guys to back the mass non-payment campaign. And he backed it. He was, he was one of our strongest supporters. And if you go through Jeremy's political life, um, Richie, you will find, in my opinion, that he's been on the right side of our class on all of the big questions throughout the last 25, 30 years. He's, even when it was unpopular, when it was unpopular to support the Birmingham Six, when it was unpopular to support the Gulf of Four, people like Jeremy Corbyn were sticking their necks out and saying that miscarriage of justice had been done. So as an individual, as an individual, I think Jeremy Corbyn is genuine. What I worry about, and this is the, the rub here, how can he ever succeed in a party that has half of them have got knives sharpened, stabbing them in the back at every turn, he really needs to have a clear out of that political party. That party, if it really genuinely wants to be a socialist party, has to get rid of the blue Tories, the, the Blairites, who couldn't give a damn about public ownership or working class life. All their interest in this feather in their own nests. I can't argue with that. I believe that he was sincere over the years. I knew, you know, the criticism he came in for, for meeting with... Um, Sinn Féin leaders in Belfast and, and elsewhere. I couldn't disagree with much or, or any of the positions and opinions expressed by Corbyn over the years. My misgivings about him were were twofold. I agree with you. He had the Blairites in his own party to deal with and I don't know if deselection is possible for him. I don't know if he has the energy for it after uh, the last two years. I don't know if the unions support him as much as they say they support him. But as well as that... Um, Entrainment is an interesting term, isn't it? Entrainment, you know, vibrated into line. Um, I just don't know, um, uh, Tommy. I really don't. I, 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 you, I, know what, you know what? Do we live in a democracy? I think, we, I think we could both agree that the guy, as a, as a man, uh, is someone I could trust. He, he's not somebody who I, I think... He's not a Tony Blair, put it that way. He's, no. he's, he's not a Gordon Brown. He, he, he's not somebody who's going to say one thing uh, and not mean it. Um, well, Jeremy probably, and, and I hope he doesn't mind, and I, I suppose, um, you know, who am I to, to offer such uh, advice? But from my point of view, Jeremy, throughout his political career, has always been a soldier. He's always been, as I say, on the front line. He might not have been a natural leader. And he might lack just a wee bit of the um, charisma that sometimes is required um, Jeremy doesn't like soundbites, and I can understand why he doesn't like soundbites, because 
politics should be more than sound bites. Yeah. But sometimes in this horrible media 24-7 world that we live in, sometimes you need to be able to swim with those particular sharks. Um, and I, he's maybe got to work a wee bit more on that. But to me, he is hamstrung. He's in the boxing ring fighting these people, and his problem is his own corner uh, is, 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 is throwing punches at him. That's, that's just a, a major, major handicap. Let me do a quick recap. I want to talk about Murdoch in a second. And thanks for your time, Tommy. We'll, 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 we'll keep you, if you don't mind, for another 10 minutes or, or thereabouts. The, 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 the only thing is, I, 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 I'm amazed that you're going away with swearing as much as you're swearing, because that's, that's three times I've heard you mention Murdoch. You know, I, I can't understand <laughs> Murdoch, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's no better man to talk about the Murdoch Empire and his newspapers than you. I'm just going to do a quick recap. If you've just joined us, uh, the politician, the broadcaster and uh, the activist, the socialist, uh, Tommy Sheridan is on the line to us. Uh, it's great to have him on the programme. Former member of the Scottish Parliament, of course. Uh, and now we turn to um, Rupert Murdoch. Now, I've been talking for years, um, including in, in my commercial radio days, about Murdoch's attempt to take over, uh, in, in, in its entirety, to take over uh, B Sky B. I remember lamenting Jeremy Hunt staying in his job as Culture Secretary when he was appointed by David Cameron, specifically appointed to that job because um, Hunt favoured Murdoch getting all of Beast Guy B. If that wasn't corruption, if that didn't bring down the government, nothing um, possibly could. But it didn't, of course, and Hunt is the Health Secretary now. It's madness to me, Tommy. You know, I went through uni, I worked in commercial and national media, radio, TV, doing my own thing now. The idea that it's even been discussed that this guy and News Corps should be allowed to uh, own so much of the media landscape in this country and there is little or no condemnation of it. Feel free to R unload. R Go ahead. R R Richie, the point you made about Jeremy Hunt and his appointment, we have to bear in mind that the only reason Murdoch didn't get his mitts on the entirety of Sky B um, all those years ago was because he was caught, because of the phone hacking scandal. That's right. That's what stopped the bid in its tracks. What we have to now say is what's changed. What's changed? This man was in charge of, as the QC at Levison called it, a thoroughly criminal enterprise. Thoroughly criminal enterprise. These people were above the law. They never just hacked phones. They hacked computers. They bought off police officers. They bought off judges. They bought off prison officers. These people have dragged journalism into a sewer. They are a cancer in society. That's, that's what the Murdoch Empire represents, a cancer, a horrible cancer that eats away at the fabric of society. How can you have an individual who has been in charge, like a mafia don, in charge of a thoroughly criminal enterprise, now be on the verge of controlling such a vast network as the whole of Sky News and the Sky Corporation? It is simply insane, Richie. It has to stop. There has to be a criminal investigation. And if the, if the forces of law and order want some evidence. I've got it in abundance. I've got absolute tirades of emails here in my own house of the type of criminality that these guys have been involved in, from perjury to subordination of perjury to perverting the course of justice, all done in the name of News Corporation. And the question is, why or oh why has News Corporation never been criminally held to account? They've got away with criminality on an industrial scale, and because they're big and powerful, and because the politicians are scared of them, then they've been able to get away with it, Richie. And, it and they've owned them. Sick, mate. Oh, you're right, and listen, you know, I should be at some time, at some stage I should be weighing in and playing the devil's advocate, but you know, arse to that, because there's, there's, there's no, there's no arguing with that sentiment there. And then, you know, we, we you, you talk about his relationship with a succession of uh, British Prime Ministers and Chancellors and other Ministers. And we're not talking about, you know, an informal, we're talking about a very, um, you know, a, a very almost incestuous relationship 
that 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 Murdoch and his minions have had with successive governments in in this country. I want to I want to talk about where that relates to what I see as the coming attack on the press, because people listening to Tommy Sheridan shouldn't be fooled and think that Tommy is in some way uh, in favour of impinging on the freedom of the press. Not at all, far from it, he isn't. And he, I don't have to defend him, he'll, he'll speak for himself in a minute here. But we, we, we segue into Max Mosley and this tyrannical idea that you sign up for Mosley's rules and regulations and his regulatory body. And if you don't, we'll screw you. And if somebody takes you to court for libel, win, lose or draw, you as a newspaper, regardless of how big or how small you are, you might have to pay their costs as well. This is a terrifying uh, outlook for me, uh, uh, Tommy. However bad these newspapers are, and they have been dreadful, you know. Um, but what, what, they're, what they're proposing as a, as a kind of a fix for this is, is worse. It's, it's unimaginable, really. Go ahead. Richie, I think when there is a vacuum, something will fill it. And obviously there is a vacuum as far as press regulation is concerned. You know, I, I, I find it very, very funny when I hear the press barons, most of them tax evading press barons that live in foreign countries but want to have a go at so-called benefit scroungers when they're, when they're, 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 yeah. they're dodging their taxes. I, I find it funny when they say that they're against regulation. You can't sell ice cream in Glasgow without being regulated. You can't drive a taxi in Glasgow without being regulated. Why the hell should you be able to sell a newspaper and not be regulated? There needs to be some form of regulation. There is a difference between regulation and control. Obviously, we need newspapers to be able to always find out what the rich and powerful are up to. Not in the bedrooms. I couldn't give a damn what they're doing in their bedrooms. What I want to know is what they're doing in the boardrooms. That's Absolutely. where the real damage gets done. That's where the real deals are getting done. That's where the real rip-offs are taking place. So from my point of view, newspapers have to try and get with it. The idea that newspapers can look after themselves and have their own regulation. I'm sorry, I don't agree with the police. The police think that they can regulate themselves. I don't agree with that. I think there should be independent regulation of the police service. And similarly in relation to the press, there has to be independent regulation so that when newspapers target somebody and tell lies about somebody, you don't get an apology in page 52 under, underneath the yeah. uh, incontinence pad advert. You get a, an apology on the front page. You get the same prominence of apology as you got with the story that attacked you in the first place. I think the newspapers have got away with murder for far too long, Richie. They and have, the, yeah. the difficulty without a, a reasonable, a reasonable regulatory independent body to be put in its place, inevitably somebody else is going to fill that vacuum, whether it's Max Mosley or anybody else. That's the key word, of course, independent. By the way, the incontinence... Um Pads ad. I'll have that in my brain all night long. Thanks for that. But you're right. <laughs> Listen, of course I'm not suggesting that they just, you know, have a Wild West type arrangement. No, of course not. But what Mosley is proposing is control. It's not regulation. That's, th that's the problem I have with that. Um, but I'm not, I don't want to be given the wrong impression. I don't think they should be allowed to act. I don't think I should be able to go on here and make allegations Absolutely. or say things let's, about listen, people, you know. An anything we do in life, let, let, let's yeah. face it, uh, Richie, anything we do in life, you know, quite frankly, we've got laws. And, and freedom of speech is something that you and I would fight to a dying breath to defend. But uh, along with freedom of speech comes responsibilities as well. And we, we, it would be wrong for us to incite um, hatred um, and, and to incite violence. The, the difficulty with some of these newspapers if you look at what they have done, the Daily Mail, the, 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 the Sun, um, the, the News of the World before it was closed down, the, 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 the Sunday Sun now, they effectively ferment the type of atmosphere which leads to attack on immigrants and people that are different. People that are different. And I think we should promote a society which celebrates differences, isn't frightened of differences. For God's sake, what a horrible world, Richie, it would all be for all the same. So from my point of view, in the absence of some form of independent regulator, the papers have got far too much power. I've had occasion to take cases to that uh, IPCC thing. And come on, it's as useful 
as a bloody chocolate teapot. Yeah, it's failed. It, it, you you're know, right. The idea that they're regulating people is just rubbish. You're right. You're hundred percent right. I can't look. I'm not going to defend that. And when I worked on in commercial radio in the past, you know, we were subject to various regulatory bodies, and those bodies weren't worth uh, the paper. Um, that you know that they, they they were dreamt up on either. I totally agree with that, but the state can't have any part in it. And I think we think we, we it, both agree with that. You know, the broadcasters are much more tightly regulated than the newspapers, and yet the newspapers, in many respects, have got just as much power, if not more. Do you know so what why are they yeah. not as tightly regulated? I have I have one look. When you talked about the news of the world, and of course in Ireland we had the Sunday World. You remember that yep. newspaper? Listen, you you, you categorise them and you describe them perfectly. But and I'm not being the devil's advocate here. In amongst all that crap and that harassment of people like you, it must be said, you know, and nobody could condone that. Amongst all of that, we did have in some, and I hate. The Sun and Murdoch and what they did to um, Liverpoolians in the wake of uh, Hillsborough. I mean, they're disgusting. But um, amongst that scum, let's call them what they are, there was some wonderful investigative journalism done, Tommy. I think investigative journalism yeah. should be separated from these papers. I mean, they, what, what you get in terms of investigative journalists, I mean, my, my, one of my biggest icons and heroes is John Pilger. And you, you'll not get a better investigative journalist than John Pilger. He's absolutely fabulous. And Top any man, of your yeah. listeners who haven't read any of John Pilger, please go and look him up and please read his stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. But investigative journalism won't die the day that we um, get rid of the last Murdoch newspaper. If anything, in my opinion, it will thrive. Because then people will be investigating the genuinely rich and powerful rather than trying to uh, upset some celebrity or, or get some tidbits on who's sleeping with who and all the rest of it. Things which, quite frankly, are, are a pile of pish and, and, and really don't fit with a, a, a proper, responsible newspaper. You're absolutely right. Stuff that is, is of no consequence. Just two points. The listeners are tweeting like mad here. And if you want later on, Tommy, I mean, you, you probably have much better things to be doing. Um, but if you have a look through... Um, the tweets that have come in. A lot of really interesting tweets there. A lot of really good points. I'll definitely look up, mate. Yeah, really good stuff. Two points that they want to take both of us up on. One, I'm getting harangued because I should have jumped at you. Allegedly, I should have jumped on you about Corbyn's flip-flop on the European Union. And look, I've I've done that to death. I've criticised Corbyn inside out for um, his criticism of the EU. And Richie, then he's flip-flop on I was disappointed, mate. I've yeah. got to say to you, I was disappointed, but you know what? I think he's a prisoner of his party. Prisoner of his own party. And the second thing um, is, um, listeners are saying they don't disagree with Tommy's um, defence of ethnic minorities. No minority should be targeted, should be humiliated, um, should be put in a position of embarrassment because of where they come from. But um, people who are concerned about immigration having a real uh, profound and a negative effect on services shouldn't be equated with the knuckle draggers that you talked about earlier on, and I endorse that because yeah, I l- yeah. listen. Listen, my, my only disagreement with uh, individuals who, who will make an argument about they're worried about immigration or they're worried about people coming to live and work in a country. First and foremost, let's be absolutely clear: every single economic assessment of immigration shows that immigrants put more into the economy than they take out of the economy. That's just a fact. It just can't be denied. So from a, a global point of view, it is wrong to suggest that immigration actually is a drain in resources. They actually pay more in taxes and, 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 and national insurance, and they put more into the economy. The problem is when we attack immigrants, Richard, when we're, when we're fear, fearful of immigrants, the problem is we let the rich off the hook. We don't have a problem with services because of immigration or immigrants. We have a problem with service provision because the rich don't pay their bloody taxes. That's, that's the problem. It's very hard to argue with that when, when you look at the money. I mean, John McDonald was on the Andrew Marr BBC Sunday morning programme a couple of weeks ago, and he had a couple of A4 pages with him, and he was able to point to specific examples of massive corporate tax avoidance schemes 
And when he rolled out the actual money that hadn't been paid into the um, into the tax purses, for want of a better way of putting it, it it it, um, it actually supported what you just said there. R- Richie, which is that, based, yeah. the, the Public and Commercial Services Trade Union commissioned a major uh, study into tax evasion, tax avoidance, and they calculated that the amount of money lost to the Exchequer every single year is one hundred and twenty billion pounds a year. 120,000 million pounds a year. See if we got the rich corporations, if we got the Starbucks of the world, if, if, if we got these major corporations like News Corporation to pay their bloody taxes, we wouldn't be talking about cuts in services, we would be talking about expanding services. Yeah, there'd, there'd be a surplus, not a deficit. Exactly. There'd be a surplus. Listen, the last thing I'll say to you on that is, look, we talk a lot about nationalism and, and you know, the we talk about the, the, the pulling back from the centralisation of power. And we talk to people who say that, you know, celebrating nationalism is run down and it's put down and people who celebrate nationalism are called xenophobic. And finally on that, and I'm giving you the final word on it, um, I'll just finish by saying this. You know, I'm... I suppose I'm going to be honest enough to say that I'm convinced that there is, we talk about this global elite all the time, and I think that one of the tools that the global elite has used against people like us is they have used divide and conquer. They've used it, and they've used mass migration to the detriment of the immigrants and the indigenous people to drive us against one another. Definitely. They have done, haven't they, Tommy? And we yeah. hate, and, and we're idiots, and we, we, we fall out, and, we, and, and you know, I, I, I know people, and they're lovely people, Tommy. I know people who are lovely people, but they, they, never, they never stop talking about immigrants, this immigrants, that immigrants, the other thing. And I think we all have it wrong. I think, well, you have it wrong. You shouldn't hate that person from Somalia or from Pakistan. You shouldn't do that. That person is here because of a direct result of the foreign policy of this government and well, government of the United States, right? right? That person's here because we bloody bombed those Absolutely countries, right. Afghanistan 100%. or Syria or Iraq. Yeah. You know, th- th- this is what pisses me off. We, 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 yeah. we hear people being anti-immigrant. I wish they'd be anti the politicians that bombed these countries in the first place. Absolutely right. I'm so glad that you said that you can that you can consider that part of that global elite agenda is to divide us through 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 that mass migration, knowing that rather than embrace one another and take on the bastards who do these things and bomb Yemen and bomb Syria, we'll fight each other over petty things like, well, you know, we don't get on, you wear a turban, I don't like you, you know, you, you go to a mosque, I can't stand you. And it works for them, doesn't it, Tommy? I'm giving you the final word on it. You, you, you know more than anybody from your own background, divide and conquer works a treat. If you can get the working classes of Ireland fighting over religion, then you don't get them fighting over wage levels. You don't get them fighting over proper pensions. And that always works for the bosses, and it works on a global scale. What I would say, Richie, in terms of this whole nationalist argument, is there has got to be an understanding. There is nothing wrong with people being patriotic about where they, they live and where they come from and having a pride in their country. I've spent lots of years visiting Cuba, for instance, and the Cuban people are very, very proud of their country. They're, 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 they have got a, a patriotic pride in their country. But you know what? They are the best internationalist country in the planet bar none in terms of sending doctors and nurses and supplies to every grief-stricken part of the world to try and help others. So there's nothing wrong with having pride in your nation but also being an internationalist. Tell you what, mate, I really enjoy that. I'm disappointed we've um, come uh, to the end. We're pretty much at the end of the programme. Tommy, um, where Anytime, can... Anytime, bro. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, we'll, we'll certainly be inviting you back again. Give us... Your your WordPress site might be down temporarily. It that... is, mate. I, do you know what it is? I've not done a blog for ages. I've, 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 I've done my law degree, and then I've done my law diploma, and then I lost my father recently. So I've, I've, not, been, I've, I've not been doing the blog stuff, uh, Richie. I apologise for that. I, I put the odd tweet on, and I, and I keep from... Uh, fighting uh, for independence, and I'll, I'll keep that going. And fighting for an independent socialist Scotland. That's that's my desire. That's my aim. My my political inspiration is a guy called John McLean, 
Richie, and if any of the listeners uh, go and look up John McLean, you'll see that he was a, an inspiring anti-First World War figure and a great Clydeside socialist. So a, gr- a great he, man. He's yeah. the guy that will keep me going. Well, listen, people can follow you on Twitter. It's at Citizen Tommy. Get on there. Wonderful thing about Tommy is he'll talk to you. Um, whether he agrees with you or disagrees with you you don't get too many people like that narcissism reigns uh, these days on social media but Tommy will have an argument with you thanks for coming on mate I thoroughly enjoyed that thanks brother it's been a pleasure Richie look after yourself bye for now Uh, Tommy Sheridan on the line to us there from uh, his home in uh, Scotland great to have him on the programme at Citizen Tommy there